right, so we are continuing our series through Romans 8, um, six weeks through this awesome chapter, and uh, we've got two weeks left. So this morning we're going to be looking at verses 18 to 25, so if you're not there yet, turn to uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 944. All right. So at our house, we have these little, they're not really bushes. It's like this little grass thing. They're like rounded. We, I, we call them the gnomes. You know, it's kind of like the hair on the gnomes. And they grow way too fast, and so they need to trim, you know, like at least once or twice a summer. And I end up usually trimming the gnomes. I've tried to, like, make it a chore and it takes so long, and like scissors are the best thing, and hands are getting tired, and anyway, so I tried this summer to, um, you know, offer like five bucks a head, which I thought was pretty generous, you know, we don't really pay our kids for chores, so, and <laughs> Ben's nine years old, and he's like, eh, five bucks, I'm like, five bucks, you're nine, what in the world? <laughs> um, so, the cost-benefit, because he's done these things before, and they are a hassle, and they grow too fast, and you have to, like, trim them back. Okay, enough about the gnomes. Um, but obviously, if I offered them a million dollars, they'd be like, sure, Dad, trim them all, trim the hedges, you know, pull all the weeds, you know, let me shine your shoes, what else can we do? All year, like, we got the yard we're covered for the year. So, okay, that's silly, but the point is, the greater the gain the willingness to take on greater pain, right? Think about the Olympians. They take on great pains in order for the hope, which is an uncertain hope, of standing on the platform, you know? So remember back in, some of you, maybe you weren't alive at this time, but if not, you can look this up later. Carrie Strug was a gymnast. Anybody remember her from 1996? And she vaulted and messed up her ankle. And it was bad. You imagine flipping and landing on a jacked up ankle. And gold medal was on the line. And she took off with this hurt ankle. And she stuck the landing and then like immediately came off that foot. She's, she's how, how do they do it? Whatever they do. Um, and she's wincing, but she stuck the landing. And, you know, basically risked even further injury, but the gain was worth the pain, and they won gold um, for the team. So I imagine if you asked her now, she would say, yeah, it was worth it. Suffering was worth it for the glory. So these themes kind of start to prepare us as we head in to Romans 8, these verses that we're going to look at. So Romans 8 is like this awesome you know, center of gravity of the Bible. There is so much here, and it's so easy for our lives to get off on secondary, third-level things, you know, certainly in our cultural moment. And we need to come back, even as Mike prayed, and get tethered and make sure that our feet are on the solid ground, um, the foundation that God's Word provides. And Romans 8 is just rock solid. It is such strong, like, stability-producing truth. And so it's been good to meditate here. I hope your meditation in Romans 8, maybe some of you, I've heard a few of you are memorizing Romans 8 during this time. That's awesome. Um, So that those meditations are sweet and they really are centering us in the right place. So last week we looked at 12, uh, 8, 12 to 17. This week, 18 to 25. So let's connect those two as we head into 18 to 25. So look at verse 16. The Spirit himself... Not itself. Spirit is a person, okay? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. So if you have turned from your sin, trusted in Jesus to save you, you've been reconciled to God as your father, and you're his child. You have his spirit dwelling within you, and so you are an heir of God and a fellow heir of God with Christ. But then it says this, provided we suffer with him. 
in order that we may also be glorified him with him. So we're children of God. And if children heirs, which is awesome, but then provided we suffer with him. So must we suffer to gain our inheritance? Yes. We must. What are you talking about? Like, we have to earn our inheritance? No. But we must suffer. So that could be a little surprising, could be a little off-putting. You know, I thought salvation was by grace, through faith in Christ. Well, you're right, it is. Think about it this way. You remember when Jesus said in Mark 8 or Matthew 16, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So must you deny yourself and take up your cross to become a Christian? Yes. So there is a cost to following Jesus. And if it's on the front end at conversion, you must count the cost. Are you willing to embrace the cost of discipleship? You know, you, you may even have had somebody share with you if you, were, if you were wrestling with Christianity and, you know, they're talking about the gospel with you and then they may have even said, make sure you count the cost. Luke 14, for example, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So here's the point. There is suffering that is part and parcel with the response to the gospel, it's called repentance. It's called, you know, saying no to being in charge of your own life. And, you know, the idols that you have bowed down to before, you're turning away from all of that. You're denying yourself as Lord of your life and trusting in Jesus to save you. You can't save yourself with your religion or whatever else. So this kind of suffering is baked in and then ongoing. There's that same kind of leaving things behind in order to follow Jesus. So Paul said in Philippians 3 that, you know, on the Damascus Road, he counted everything as loss in view of what he gained in Christ for the sake of Christ. And then he continued to count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus his Lord. So, there is a cost. Is it, a, is it like a, you know, not a great deal? Oh, no, no. This is awesome. The cost is real, but it's real in the sense of like the treasure hidden in the field. Remember we talked about that last week? So, you got to sell all you have to buy the field. Oh, man, that's a lot of loss. But what if your estate is worth $300,000 and the treasure in the field is worth $30 trillion? Is it a sacrifice? No, not at all. So don't downplay the cost, but make sure you keep the cost in view with the gain. The gain makes the pain worth it and actually puts the pain in perspective. So that's kind of a way to answer it maybe, you know, at the head level, struggling with this. It doesn't mean that, you know, we earn our way to heaven or we have to do enough to be good enough. No, no. But we all struggle, I think, at an emotional, kind of volitional level where when we do suffer, we ask questions like, is this worth it? Like, is my suffering worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Sometimes we just get weary. Sometimes we just wonder why God won't throw us a bone. So the, questioning is, the question is, first point in the outline, is the suffering worth the glory? Because listen, we're only going to be willing to pay the cost if we believe it's worth it. And if we really see things, <laughs> that dude that sold everything that he had, sold everything that he had in, in his joy. 
went and sold all that he had because of the value of that field. So we really need to see the value of the glory that is to be revealed to us. So do we believe it's worth it? We need to ask that not just at some intellectual level, but heart level, brass tacks, you know, Monday morning, real life, especially when we're suffering. So, let me just give you another example of how this works out, okay? If you struggle sometimes wondering if it's worth it, you're not alone. Book of Hebrews, similar issue. Look at chapter 10. I think we have this um, text ready. You can follow along this way. So in, in 1032, but recall the former days. See, these were some people that were drifting. They were wandering. They were shrinking back from following Jesus. And the writer says, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. How in the world could you do that? How could you go visit Christians who were in prison for their faith, which means you might be next, and joyfully accept the confiscation of your property, well, only if you know about the gain, that you yourself have a better possession and an abiding one that they can't take away from you. So the writer says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for, and he quotes Old Testament, yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay. It's Habakkuk. But my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, so people with genuine faith and the writer's trying to encourage them, this is you. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So they needed a reminder. It's worth it. Hang in there. Don't throw it away for a pittance, for a bowl of porridge. Trust me, you need to endure. And your endurance will be worth it. There's a great reward. So is the suffering worth the glory? Paul would like to answer that question for us this morning. He's done the math. Okay, so here's his conclusion. Point number two, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So the contrast is probably fairly obvious, right? Between suffering and glory. Or even more accurately, the present suffering and the future glory. Okay, Paul, but like not worth comparing? He doesn't say, so the suffering will all be worth it. He says a whole lot more than that. He says it's not even worth comparing. Anybody bristling at all? Any pushback, rise up? Has it ever risen up in the past? Like you have no idea what I'm going through. Well, you, you may be right. Maybe I don't know what you've gone through. Certainly Paul doesn't know what you've gone through. But this is the inspired word of God, and God knows everything that you've been through and everything that you will go through in this life under the sun. And he is telling you through the pen of the Apostle Paul that this is the answer in the back of the book to the problem of suffering. Paul did the math. This is the answer in the back of the book. And not only will it be worth it, and, you know, oftentimes we can doubt that, right? But he goes further. You've got to let this sink in way further. No matter what you go through, no matter what you've been through, The sum total of all your suffering in this life is not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
Paul does not have rose-colored glasses on, okay? He knows that there are some horrific things that can happen to God's people in this life. He is no blind optimist, okay? This man has suffered and suffered greatly. Have you ever read his list of sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11? Just listen to it. I'll blow through it really quickly here. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with, beating, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from, uh, apart from all that, there's the daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. And 2 Corinthians wasn't even written at the end of Paul's life. He lived for probably eight to ten more years. And we know he was involved in at least one more shipwreck at the end of Acts. <laughs> so how many shipwrecks have you been involved in? Um, anyway, so given some of the horrible sufferings that some believers have endured. Think about Afghani believers right now. North Korea believers. The glory that is to be revealed to us must be glorious and wonderful beyond our comprehension. If this is true, that the worst sufferings of this life, like Job's sufferings, are not even worth putting on the scale. They wouldn't even register. So again, we could chafe at that a little bit. We could push back, but stop for a second and think, isn't this what we've longed for all along? Like, don't you want it to be this way? <laughs> and it is. Like, so the real problem that by, God, by God's grace, I think we can take aim at is not Paul's or God's nerve to say this so confidently, but what we need to address is that we have such a small idea of what God has planned for us. God is telling us here, you, believer, brother or sister in Christ, you will never, ever come to the end, which is really the beginning, and say, oh man, is this it? disappointing. No. Paul's already said it in Romans 5. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. It's purposeful. Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. We are not going to be ashamed at the end thinking, what a sucker I was. We're not going to be disappointed. We're not going to be put to shame. We're going to be glorified and glorying in the glory of the resurrection and the new creation. It's sin and all of its false promises that always disappoint. Sin is what overpromises and under delivers. I love this quote, old quote by Jeremiah Burroughs. He says, My brothers and sisters, the reason why you have not got contentment in the things of the world is not because you've not got enough of them. That's the lie we believe, if I just had a little more. That's not the reason, but the reason is because they are not things proportionable to that immortal soul of yours that is capable of God himself. Many men think that when they're troubled and have not got contentment, it's because they have but a little in the world. And if they had more, they would be content. That is just as if a man, I love this, were hungry, and to satisfy his craving stomach, he should gape and hold open his mouth to take in the wind, and then should think that the reason why he's not satisfied is because he's not got enough of the wind. No, the reason is because the thing is not suitable to the craving stomach. So Paul gives the answer. It's, it's only sin and its promises that are going to disappoint us. God will not disappoint us. 
Okay, the hope of glory will not, will not, will not disappoint us. God gives us, or Paul gives us the answer to the question, is it worth it? Will the future glory make up for my suffering? Absolutely, and way beyond that. It will be so glorious and weighty and great that your suffering, no matter what it is, is not even worth comparing. He confidently, Paul says confidently, no comparison. I've done the math. Okay, but you can imagine maybe some of you are saying, can you show your work? <laughs> like, give us a hand here, Paul, show your work. Like, I'm with you, but would you show your work? Like your seventh grade algebra teacher, you know, like, I got the answer. Got to show your work. Okay. How'd you get there, Paul? Well, his answer is interesting. He could have gotten there from lots of passages. You know, if we had like all day, we could go to Isaiah 11, Isaiah 25, Isaiah 35. Isaiah 65, Psalm 1611, you made known to me, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Fullness forever. What's better than that? The reason we're not satisfied is because it's never fullness. Like, oh, it just falls short. Or this great thing doesn't last. And what God offers us, the hope, the joy, future joy and satisfaction is fullness forever. So, okay, Paul shows his work. Watch how he does so. He's going to show that the hope of the creation and the hope of the Christian make this true. Okay, so here we go. Creation on tiptoe, and then we'll look at um, the already is not enough. So first the creation and then the hope of the Christian. Verse 19, point number three. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and he subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So the picture here is creation personified like on tiptoe, longing, waiting for this to come craning its neck for the day when the birth pangs will give way to new life and freedom for the whole creation. So, basically, this world cannot wait to become the perfect cosmic playground for the children of God. I mean, obviously, the world was subjected to futility, right? Genesis 3, 17, Adam said, or God said to Adam, Because you've eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Why is your Monday through Friday so hard? Thorns and thistles. Futility. Right? The creation has been subjected to futility. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. So earthquakes and tsunamis and tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and droughts and you know, hazardous waste and pollution and oil spills and on and on and on. The creation is just like, you can imagine like, (coughs) it's just like coughing and groaning and it can't wait for Jesus to come back and make everything new. For it to be this perfect garden city, paradise for the children of God. That was how it was created originally. And then it was subjected. It was cursed and subjected, not willingly, but in hope. Because it's not going to be like this forever. So, so all this stuff in the world, groans, birth pangs of a broken, cursed world, this world longs for the day when it's going to be set free from the curse. When it will be renewed and remade and returned to its original perfection and even beyond. So, it was subjected in hope. And that hope is registered right there in Genesis 3, right? 
So the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you, on your belly you'll go. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the serpent bites Jesus on the heel, but he crushes the serpent's head. And the new creation, when Jesus rose from the dead, the new creation began. He is the pioneer of the new creation. The first prototype, resurrected body, unable to die, holding the keys, has already risen. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's only a matter of time. So, subjected, but in hope. So just as birth pangs lead to the joy of life and the end of those pains when a woman gives birth, so the creation longs for the cosmic rebirth that comes with the renewal of all things. It's a really cool thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but in Matthew 29, or I'm sorry, 29. Yeah, that would be in the Out of This World translation or something of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so Genesis 19, sorry. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. Okay, so Je- Matthew 19, 28. Little um, dyslexia there. Okay, so, and Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, is this up here? Okay. That you who have followed me in the regeneration, or your translation might say in the new world, or at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So why do, why do I bring that up here? Well, the word for regeneration there is the same word that's used in Titus chapter 3. So Titus 3, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. How? By the washing of regeneration. You were given new birth, new life. You were regenerated, made new. By the washing and regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, right? 2 Corinthians 5. So what does that mean? Christians are a foreshadowing of the new creation in fullness. We are a preview of coming attractions. We are the vanguard. We're the forerunners of the new creation. It's already broken in. It broke in initially with Jesus' resurrection. And every time God saves somebody, boom, they go from darkness to light. They go from deadness to life. It's new creation. It's happening everywhere. Bam, 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 bam. Like, it's happening. It's coming. And one day, the whole cosmos is going to be regenerated made new, new birth. That's why Jesus uses that word in Matthew 19. You got cl- trees clapping their hands. You know, everything is just going to be awesome. Revelation 21, 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is where it's all headed. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. So this is what we, as new creations, were remade for. It's what we long for. That's why, you know, maybe that passage Mike read is a little strange, like tense and groaning and what in the world is going on. Basically, what Paul is saying is, yes, to die, to live as Christ, to die is gain. To die, it's better right? Because we're with Jesus. We're out of suffering. But it's not what we really want. We don't want to be torn from our bodies. Our bodies go in the ground and decay. We don't want to just float around in this, like, ethereal existence, you know, disembodied souls. God created us 
with these good, good, very good bodies. He likes matter. So, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home, this body, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, don't we? Yes, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Believers groan, Romans 8. Longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked, disembodied souls. For while we are still in this tent, flesh we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, that's not what we ultimately want. But that we would be further clothed. We long for the renewal of all things. We long for the resurrection. Don't you want a new body that's not going to decay like this one? So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage because of this hope that is ours. So this is what we were remade for. This is what we long for, which is why the already is not enough. What in the world do I mean by that? Well, how many of you are familiar with, you know, the theological language of already but not yet? Okay, some of you. If you're not, it's totally fine. Um, the ten cent theological phrase terminology is inaugurated eschatology. Anybody? So eschatology, what happens at the end, but inaugurated. Like the end has broken into time and it's already started. So God's going to renew all things, but he's already made you new in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. Already, but not yet. You see? So things like you've been given new life in Christ, but our bodies still die and decay. So we await the resurrection. You've been redeemed, set free from the slavery of sin, but we still struggle with the presence of sin, and it can be enslaving, and we can't wait to be totally free from the slavery and the struggle with sin. You've been justified, but we still struggle with that condemning voice, right? And Satan loves to wag his finger. And we can't wait the cosmic declaration of vindication. Well done, good and faithful servant. There are some people who've been rejected by their families because of their faith, who've been persecuted and marginalized. And one day, Jesus, before everyone, publicly, cosmically, for them, there is therefore now no condemnation. But they are constantly condemned and marginalized and persecuted. But Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is going to say before everyone, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Like this amazing cosmic justification, vindication. Okay? This one is mine. Pardoned. Righteous. So, Already, but not yet. So the already is wonderful, isn't it? (laughs) There is therefore now no condemnation. That's awesome. We have been set free from sin. We don't have to, we're not debtors of the flesh anymore, right? We're not obligated. It's wonderful, but it's not enough. (laughs) In fact, it's the already is what creates the longing for the not yet. It's why we groan. It's why we eagerly await. We've gotten a taste. We've had the appetizer, and we're like, bring on the feast. The first fruits are organically connected to the full harvest in that sense. Like we've tasted, but we can't wait. We groan because we have the Spirit, not because we're not walking by the Spirit. So, Listen, this might be really helpful for you struggling Christian, like who isn't in that category. Your very struggle and disconnect, discontent and restlessness and like, oh, I hate, you know, Romans 7 type struggle. I'm always doing what I don't want to do and like who will free me from the body of this death? Like I'm such a pathetic Christian. Wait, wait. Your very struggle is the result of God's grace in you. Your longing to be set free is evidence that he's in you and with you. Not like, maybe I'm not even the real thing because I'm 
what, not perfect yet? Not like walking six inches off the ground? Like, come on, we're still going to struggle. And the very fact that you long to be set free from those things is proof positive that the Spirit is within you and you have that hope and you're crying out, Abba, Father. The Spirit's testifying with your spirit. So we groan because we have the Spirit, not because we're not walking by the Spirit. Things are not as they should be. I don't have to convince anybody of that. And they're going to be infinitely better. So wouldn't it make all the sense in the world that we would eagerly long for the fullness to come? Like, we can't wait. Well, actually we can't. <laughs> we need to. So we can't. So we can't wait, but we can, right? So look at verse 23. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Do you see already but not yet right there? Like, wait, I thought we were already adopted. I thought we were already redeemed. Yes, but we want to be brought home. Full adoption, like fullness. Wait, I thought we were already redeemed. Yes, brought out of Egypt, <laughs> but we're not in the promised land yet. Like, we still need to be completely set free from sin's effects. So, in this hope, we were saved. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So we can't wait. We eagerly await. But we can wait. Like, of course, this is, like the Christian's life, is a life of hope. We're headed somewhere. And we can't wait to get there. And it's coming. So Ray Ortland said this. I've quoted that Supernatural Living for Natural People a number of times. Great little book on Romans 8. When your heart is aching to be rid of sin and frailty, that is not because your Christian life isn't working, but because it is working. Holy restlessness argues life. It argues the presence of the Holy Spirit within you. So we can't wait we long, we groan, and we must wait. We wait. And we need to keep reminding ourselves and each other, do that in your community groups, that it is worth the wait. We're going to need this, like, over and over again. This isn't like, oh, it's worth the wait. So now, thank you for telling me that, and I will be fine the rest of my life. Like, we're going to need that reminder and so that we can do that cost-benefit analysis and say it's not worth comparing. So last point, worth the wait. There's a lady named Vanitha Risner. I think I'm pronouncing that last name right. She wrote a book called The Scars That Shape Us. You can imagine that title has a double meaning. She suffered a lot. The Scars That Shape Us. Her suffering and the scars of Jesus. So she lives with disability. She had her first operation at two, 21 operations between ages two and 13. So polio at three months. Within 24 hours, she was paralyzed due to a doctor's mistake. As a kid, she was bullied all the time. All, like just about every day, kids asking, what's wrong with you? gets married, has a child. The baby died as a baby. This is like, had the baby out of the womb, had the child, baby died because of a doctor's mistake. 2003, she was diagnosed with post-polio syndrome. 2009, her husband left her for another woman and then filed for divorce. And she felt like God was against her, as you can imagine. She'd sometimes just lay on the floor and cry, cry out to God. So I'm going to play a little two-minute clip from a video. If you want to read her story, um, you can find that book, The Scars That Shape Us, but a little two-minute clip before we close. 
I think my disability went, went from being something that made me bitter to something that really drew me to God and made me more dependent on Him. Every time, like through all the different types of suffering, um, what's really pulled me out or pulled me through is God's walking with me. And that to me has been bigger and worth every second of suffering, which sounds crazy even as I sit here and tell you that, but it has anchored my faith in a way that, you know, I think people, when you read the Bible and you understand truth and you say, this makes sense to me, but then people can argue you out of that. I mean, I've seen people with faith just kind of say, well, it doesn't make sense now and I'm not sure and other people are telling me things, but when you go through the fire and God is right there, like I know He's real. He's there. He's walked with me. I think adversity, if we turn to God in it, it keeps us from walking away because we need Him. We know Him in a different way as not just the giver of good gifts, but the, the one who walks with us. And I don't think you see that many people who get the sense of God's presence, God walking with them, unless they call out to Him and they need Him. Having a mom who is pointing me to the Lord even when things are tough, and that's an understatement, um, I guess really made me the believer that I am today. The Lord has done this for a purpose. We don't know what it is, but we wait. I feel like it was God's grace to give me suffering because it has made me deeper and made me love God, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. So you know what the title of that video is? Worth Every Second. So this suffering, your suffering, whether it's worse than hers or less than hers, is still nothing compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. That is how glorious our future hope is so we don't lose heart though outwardly we are wasting away inwardly we can be renewed day by day for these light momentary afflictions are producing in us an eternal weight of glory so Paul again is not a blind optimist. At the beginning of 2 Corinthians, he said, don't want you Corinthians to be unaware. When we were in Asia, we were burdened beyond our ability to bear. We just felt like we had the death sentence. It's over. Burden beyond your ability to bear, but then light and momentary afflictions? How do you get from here to there? So Paul's realistic and he's honest. But the point is, if you get those suffering burdens and weights and put them next to the eternal weight of glory, they just don't compare. And in comparison, they're light and momentary. So, Romans 5, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So I'm going to close with a, a quote that I love here that I think puts this in just stark relief, and then we're going to sing the song Christ our hope in life and death because we need to keep preaching this to ourselves we have a blessed great hope and it is all worth it
and we need to remind ourselves. So I'm going to read this quote, and then musicians, you can come on up now. We'll sing that song, and then we'll have a few minutes for community discussion. Spiritual death means hell. Now suppose both death and hell were utterly defeated. Suppose the fight was fixed. Suppose God took you on a crystal ball trip into your future and you saw with indubitable certainty that despite everything, your sin, your smallness, your stupidity, you could have, free for the asking, your whole crazy heart's deepest desire, heaven, eternal joy. Would you not return fearless and singing? What can earth do to you if you are guaranteed heaven? To fear the worst earthly loss would be like a millionaire fearing the loss of a penny, less a scratch on a penny. Oh God, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to see the blessed hope that is ours in Christ so that we do not lose heart. That we would look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen and experience the soul-strengthening and encouraging that happens when the eternal weight of glory puts our sufferings in their proper perspective. So help us, Lord, that we might not lose heart, but that we would be of good courage all the way home. In Jesus' name, amen.